Um, you know from the program, it's Kay Kaplowitz. Now, I don't know how much you know about Kay. She grew up in Milwaukee, um, and I think at a very early age exhibited a certain flair for what she became, which was a very outstanding and continues to be outstanding entrepreneur. Because I've read about Kay that when she was five years old, her parents moved. They were in a working class neighborhood of Milwaukee. They moved to South Milwaukee. Kay was in kindergarten. It was halfway through the school year. And she said, I refuse to leave my school class. I've got to finish the year out. And she persuaded her father that she should have an increase in her allowance so that she could take the bus and complete the school year, the kindergarten, at age five. Her parents said okay and did this. Now, this may be hard to imagine in this day and age, but I think that sort of spirit of independence and enterprise, plus amazing parental confidence, I have to say, okay, uh, tells you something about the character of our speaker. She grew up in Milwaukee. She went to the University of Wisconsin at Madison, one of the world's beautiful campuses, where she uh, got her bachelor's degree and got into radio TV production right away in Milwaukee at a local TV station, which explains her early interest in media and TV. She got a master's in communication at Michigan State in East Lansing, and she did her master's thesis on satellite technology and got very interested in the possibility of what would happen in a world where there was more open access to programming instead of the sort of exclusive control of the dominant networks. Uh, she spent a brief time at ComSat and at UA Cablevision, and then in 1977, she and a partner launched what would become USA Networks. Uh, USA was television's first advertiser-supported basic cable network at that time. Uh, it started as an all-sports service. It was Madison Square Garden Sports, and she was the first person to negotiate cable programming in sports with the NBA and the Major League Baseball and the hockey and all the, all the big sports. Uh, she was the founder and the CEO uh, of this network, which became USA Network. She was the first woman network president in TV history. She built USA Network to a number one rank among primetime viewers among cable networks for 13 consecutive seasons or years, a pretty remarkable record. And then in 1998, uh, they sold USA Networks to Home Shopping Network for, it was a private transaction, but rumored to be in the neighborhood of $4.5 billion. And since 1998, she has uh, her own media advisory and investment firm. And perhaps even more interestingly, she's launched several ventures that I suspect are very important in her life. Uh, one is Springboard Enterprises, which is a venture capital investor in women-led high-growth companies. Another is called Bold Cap Ventures, which is a VC fund that's backed exclusively by leading women executives. And a third is the Directors Council, which is a search firm for independent directors, and in particular, independent directors from the women and minority ranks. She's on the board now of Liz Claiborne and Instanet. She used to be on the board of Oracle, Nabisco, and General Re, so she's been around a lot of boardrooms. She's on innumerable nonprofits that I won't mention. Uh, on top of everything else, she's an author of a book that came out just a couple years ago called Bold Women, Big Ideas to inform and to inspire women entrepreneurs. I think you'll agree, a very uh, suitable keynote speaker for our entrepreneurship conference. So please welcome to the Stanford Business School, Kay Kaplowitz. Kay. <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction, Dean. It was, um, you know, uh, it is a story that I sometimes tell about my, uh, my uh, escapades in kindergarten, but people often want to know, and you've sort of from Milwaukee. Now, Milwaukee is a very kind of old uh, uh, industrial town, 
It's uh, the biggest industry when I was growing up, there was uh, actually brewing beer. Um, we had many breweries, Blatz, Schlitz, uh, many different uh, uh, brewing companies that, uh, Paps, Blue Ribbon. Uh, and so that was kind of our main uh, source of income in our town besides uh, old line manufacturing. So it's had to make some changes, but it certainly wasn't the uh, seat of uh, technology or even entrepreneurism in a lot of different fields. It was a different kind of uh, environment that I grew up in. But the story that you told about uh, kindergarten was kind of my first inkling that um, the art of the deal uh, was you know, kind of seductive. I kind of liked that, negotiating with my dad. But I thought it said more about my parents in a lot of ways, because my parents encouraged us. I'm a, I'm, I like to say to them that I am the ne neglected middle child, because I am the middle child, and uh, uh, far from neglected. But I like to tease them with that. And thank God, they're in their 90s, they're still alive, and they're still around, and they're still great parents. They uh, wanted us all to be independent. And uh, I think their act of uh, allowing me to do that, um, uh, take a bus to the next town so I could graduate to my kindergarten class, um, showed great faith and also made, us respo made me responsible. I was responsible even at that age, but I, I think it really made me realize that I had negotiated that now. My dad also said to me at the same time, it, you know, snows a lot in Milwaukee. He said, you're, no one's going to come pick you up. I mean, you're going to walk to the bus, and you're going to walk home, and you're going to stand out there for, you know, for whatever amount of time, and don't call your mother and ask her to pick you up. And of course, we didn't have cell phones then. So how was I going to call her anyway? I mean, but he said, uh, you don't ask her to do anything. And, you know, and I said, that's a deal. And I was really happy to make that deal. And it taught us one of the little lessons when you're growing up uh, that uh, really helps you kind of understand who you are. But I think for all of us who are interested in entrepreneurism, I think every little element of success is important uh, because success breeds success. You feel confident. You get to be more confident in yourself. And so I sometimes like to tell that story because it, it really was my first recollection of really having sort of the negotiated <laughs> deal, if you will. Um, I'd, um, I went on to uh, the University of Wisconsin, as you said, and uh, as a student, I mean, I went through high school. There were it's kind of interesting. Only about six percent of my high school class went to college at that time. It's hard to think that at this point, but uh, uh, because it seems like everybody goes to college. But uh, it was really a, a period of time where there was kind of a transition in the marketplace, and I was a science student actually, and I was uh, going to medical school. I thought. Um, I had my classes in biological sciences, which I was very interested in. And uh, something happened to me sort of on the way to medical school, which diverted my attention. And you might all say to yourself, so some people in the room here are already entrepreneurs and some people, let's see, who is out actually starting a company in the room here? Okay, about half the room, well that's good. Well, you already know then uh, what happens when you want to have the light bulb come on. What is your idea? How did you well, find your idea? How did you decide on it? It kind of reminds me of a time I was speaking to some students at the um, at uh, university in uh, British Columbia uh, and giving a talk about entrepreneurism. And there was, at the end of the class, a gentleman came up to me. He was uh, Chinese. And he came up to me and he, he said, uh, I have to ask you a very important question. And I said, what, what's a very important question? He said, how do you know? How do you know when it's the time to be an entrepreneur? And, and he was so very serious about it. And I said, you know, you probably think of a lot of ideas and they sound kind of good to you. But when that idea just keeps coming back and back and you keep thinking about it and you will know the time Believe me, if this is what you think you want to do, you will have the time and you will know. And he said, ah, oh, thank you. And that's what, sort of what happens. Someday you actually know. So I say to you, in my life, what would these people have in common? Arthur C. Clarke. Do we know who Arthur C. Clarke is in this room? 
noted science fiction writer, you'll find out. And Muhammad Ali, boxing, <laughs> big boxing great, George Steinbrenner. He's the same George Steinbrenner that still uh, runs the Yankees. But what do they have in common? Let me tell you. For me, from my perspective, between my junior and senior year in college, I went to Europe, uh, mostly to play. Um, but I did stop in and talk to a few people uh, about the media business and about some other science things that I was interested in. And I had the good fortune of going to the London School of Economics and hearing a speaker talk about geosynchronous orbiting satellites. And you might say to yourself, who cares? Geosynchronous orbiting satellites? I thought this was the most fascinating lecture I had heard on technology, and this was in the 60s. Um, most of you weren't alive then, I would take it. Um, and uh, we didn't have satellites uh, to use for commercial purposes at that time. And geosynchronous orbiting satellites were important because they allowed us to communicate with only three satellites around the world, uh, in a total round the world pattern. So it really, they were appeared to be stationary over the same place on Earth. They were moving at such a speed at 22,300 miles above the surface of the Earth, and it gave us a vastly more open network of communications. I thought this was so fascinating, and this lecture was being given by Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke wrote 2001 A Space Odyssey and many other science fiction novels, and that's what we knew him for at that time. But he was actually a United States scientist, and he wrote about this coming out of the Second World War um, in 1945 and was continuing to write about it, and now he was lecturing about it. And he so captivated my imagination that I changed my direction, didn't go to medical school, didn't become a neurosurgeon. And there's probably a lot of brains walking around today very happy that I went into television. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I was so excited about the opportunity that I came back and I thought, oh, I was in the, working my way through school as a television producer, so I had the television background, and I thought to myself, this can really open communications. Now let me paint a picture for you, because you won't know this. At that time, there were only three television networks, two or three independent stations in major cities, and nothing else in the television environment. That was it. So it wasn't what we have today. And I thought there's a real opportunity to open up this window and really, I was thinking something much more maybe esoteric at the time because I was thinking this could really penetrate political borders. You can't stop satellite transmission the way you can stop terrestrial transmission. It can change cultures. It can open up people's minds. And it will perhaps have great impact on our political and cultural environment around the world where people could actually really communicate with one another. Now, I'm not going to stand here and say that satellites actually were the reason that the Berlin Wall fell or that we had Tiananmen Square or any of the other really huge breakthroughs in the change of political structures around the world or opening of markets but I will say it had a big effect on it because I think once people know you can never take an idea away. The mind is a wonderful tool and it's a wonderful asset. And once you really have the grasp of an idea of at least freedom to communicate, to share messages, to learn and to understand different cultures, things change. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but that was really so motivating to me. And of course, Arthur C. Clarke, still alive, lives in Sri Lanka, and is still writing science fiction, um, uh, was a man who changed my life. What came next? Okay, flash forward, we're in the middle 70s now, and we still don't have satellites to use for commercial use here um, in the United States. And I was working in the cable industry because I really felt that if any industry needed new product, which didn't have any new, didn't have any networks of its own, this was the industry. And there was one night that changed the course of television history. And which, what night was that? September 30th, 1975, it was the thrill of the Manila. 
I don't know how many of you have ever followed boxing, but it was the third matchup between Muhammad Ali and George Fraser. It is one of the greatest boxing matches in the history of boxing. I happen to be a sports fan, uh, so it's a good thing, I guess, that I went into sports, but I happen to also be a boxing fan, and I, Ali was my guy. I was happy he won um, that night. Uh, it was really um, a fantastic <coughs> event. Well, what, why did it change the course of television history? Because that was the night that we brought in our industry. I did this for Home Box Office, which was just a tiny little company at that time, owned by Time Inc. We demonstrated that this fight could be brought from Manila around the globe into the homes of cable subscribers uh, very efficiently and to be used for a good commercial purpose. And we had congressmen and senators, a couple hundred uh, business leaders there to demonstrate this product. And it was such a perfect demonstration because it was a fantastic matchup. The signal was perfect. The quality was perfect. And it was actually the night that we got the approval uh, to use satellite technology for this business. And that changed the course of history. And the reason I say that is because that night, Bob Rosencrantz, who was my partner in launching USA, was a man I worked for in the cable industry who knew this is what I wanted to do, and we knew what the plan was. We changed the economic model of television. What was occurring and still occurs today is that the broadcast networks pay the television stations to carry their product. What we did, and they only have advertising as revenue, what we did was we switched the model and we had the cable systems pay us for the programming. So the, the flow was the other way. And it was a simple, simple idea. But it was a reason you could really build cable networks at that time because you had such a small distribution, uh, you couldn't support it only on advertising. And so it changed the course of television history because today what we have access to, all these networks that didn't exist at that time, um, really are dependent on having two, tele two sources of revenue. It wouldn't be here if we didn't have them because the licensing revenue that the cable systems pay the programmers really is... Uh, what has lifted them off the ground and sustains them even today. So that was a really important evening, and uh, I think about it often and uh, how it really did change the course of history. But there was another event that followed that. After, after that event, uh, Bob, and we really did launch USA in 1977. It was called Madison Square Garden Sports, and the reason we did that is because the first 125 events that we secured uh, live events that we secured were from Madison Square Garden. And uh, so it was, Madison Square Garden was the, kind of the pinnacle of what one could do in sports. That was the biggest arena you could play in sports. It was a great brand to be able to market out there. But we needed a lot more sporting events. There are 365 days a year. We wanted at least 365 live events to show every set one, at least one every single night. So I took it upon myself to go out and find other events, and I went to the major leagues, of course. And I called George Steinbrenner, because he owned the Yankees then, as he does now. And uh, I know that uh, people either love or hate the Yankees, but they will watch the Yankees. And I, I went to see him. And he's known as a difficult business uh, you know, partner, but I didn't have a very hard time getting a contract from him. I actually just told him how I was building this network out on cable and how I would pay him additional uh, money per new subscriber each season. We'd measure how many subscribers there were and I would increase the, the flow of revenue and he bought into it. So I signed this contract and in April 1979, we did our first baseball game. It was a great classic matchup between the Yankees and the Red Sox, still a classic matchup today, and it went extra innings. Uh, the Yankees won in 14 innings when Roy White hit a home run, and it was you know, all very exciting, and I was thrilled with the launch of this new you know, series of programs, Major League Baseball. I get to my office the next morning. The phone rings. I answer the phone, and it's the commissioner of Major League Baseball, who was then Bowie Kuhn. And he said, oh, Ms. Koplovitz, I see that you televised these Yankee games last night. I said, yeah, wasn't that great? 
did you see the game? It was extra innings. I'm so excited. I'm sure our Phillies loved it. And listen, I'm going to go on and on, waxing uh, with enthusiasm as one does when you're an entrepreneur. And he said, this compliment, that's not the reason I'm calling you. And I thought, oh, it isn't. Why are you calling me then? And he said, I'm calling to say that you didn't have the right to televise that game. And I said, what do you mean I didn't have the right? I have this contract with George Steinbrenner. I signed this with the Yankees. And he said, yeah, that's my point, Ms. Koplovitz. He didn't have the right to sell it to you. You see, George hasn't ever changed. Uh, he, was <laughs> he was trying to get baseball. He was trying to grab territory in baseball and you know, outshine all the other baseball owners, of course. And um, I didn't know what to, I had just launched this. I had just sold this into my cable. Now, believe me, at this point in time, we're talking small. I, there were two and a half million maybe cable subscribers across the country that could receive these games at the time. And, uh, but still, I mean, they were my customers and I had sold in to the cable operators for extra money. I'd sold in these, uh, this Yankee series. And I thought, oh, I'm in big trouble. I mean, I was an entrepreneur. Sometimes you think you, you know, you you know, you're at the cliff, sort of. And I thought, uh oh, I'm gonna deep six on this one. So I'm like a little nervous. So I go and talk. It happens to be my husband is a communications lawyer, and he worked for the company that I used to work with. We we used to work there together when we were children. And um, the uh, I went down to his office and I said, hey, B hey, Billy, uh, I got this call from Billy Kuhn. This is what he said, and he's going to get a restraining order to stop me from televising any more games. What do you think? And he said, well, I think that Steinbrenner's probably trying to impede on other people's territories. You see, the rule was you could, you could actually send your signal out where there weren't other baseball territories, but not in other baseball territories. So he was really invading others' territories, and he actually was violating the league rules, <clears throat> I later found out. But I thought, oh, my God, what am I going to do? So I go back to my office, <clears throat> and I called Billy back. And I said, I'm telling him how much of this means to the industry and how it can really build baseball and how good it's going to be. He's not buying it, not buying it. And uh, I'm getting nowhere. And so I'm thinking to myself, what am I said, I said, OK, I'll trade you. And he said, trade me? What are you talking about? Trade me what? I said, I'll trade this Yankee deal for a Major League Baseball deal, and I'll televise the games of all the teams. Silence. I waited and waited. And then he said, I'll see you in my office tomorrow morning, Ms. Koplovitz. And that's how I traded the Yankees for Major League Baseball. So uh, you know, it's kind of uh, fun as an entrepreneur to sort of you kind of have to be able to scramble out of uh, situations like this. I went on right after that to negotiate <clears throat> the NBA with uh, David Stern, who was then the general counsel and not the commissioner of the NBA and the NHL and oh, golf and tennis and a whole bunch of other things. But the funny thing is about David, who remains a very close friend of mine today, <laughs> is that he loves to remind me, and sometimes in public, that we paid him a measly $400,000 that first year for the NBA contract. And you know, I like to remind him that on the back of that, he's made billions of dollars ever since. So it works out for both of us. Uh, it's um, I love the sport. Sports was a very uh, easy. Um, it's a very easy business compared to the entertainment business, quite frankly. I mean, in sports, it's it's basically getting the rights. Uh, you know, outbidding your competition for the rights. But by the late 90, by later in, in 1979 and 1980, um, I started diversifying a little bit and adding other kinds of programming uh, and renamed the company USA Network uh, because I really felt that I wanted something that people could all feel it was theirs and that they had ownership of it. Uh, and so we changed the name and, and started building out some other kind of programming as well as sports. But Right at that juncture, that's when other people started coming online. Um, WTBS was out there as a superstation. Uh, this is about, about 1980 was the time that MTV started, uh, CNN started, all these big names that you recognize today all got started sort of like right at the end of 1979, 1980, 1981. That was a really robust period of time. So a lot more 
uh, networks, another maybe dozen or so uh, networks came uh, into being and competition started heating up a little bit. ESPN at that time, about 1979, launched as a little regional college sports network in Connecticut. And they had college sports and they were, they had none of the major league sports or anything like that. Um, but I learned a lot of lessons along the way and, and uh, one, a couple of things I want to talk about are some of the lessons because I think that some of these critical inflection points while you're an entrepreneur are sort of really important um, to uh, you know, understand how people make decisions. And one of the decisions that really affected the, the future of USA at that time was that it was sold in 1981. It was sold to Time Inc., Paramount, and Universal, and why? Bob Rosencrantz, my partner at the time, had a, his own public company, UA Columbia, and he was at the short end of a hostile takeover. And his, so he really felt he needed cash. He wanted some cash. And in 1981, this is the end of 1981, there was no, still no market for these companies in the public market. I wanted to take it public. And of course, <laughs> wouldn't we all? And uh, uh, there just wasn't any market for it. Uh, so we really couldn't sell it into the open marketplace. And so it was sold to these three companies. And it was kind of a, a strange bedfellows put together because these three companies had just been in major lawsuits against one another over, um, over some other companies that they had launched in competition. And it was a very bitter battle. And it had just finished. And, and uh, the Universal and Paramount were in, in court against Time Inc. And so that just got settled. And I think I felt like sort of a pretty girl that came along <laughs> just at that time and got a date with these three companies because they, after that, they began to fight with each other all over again. So there are a lot of experiences I had as a, an entrepreneur in trying to build this company, building it out, and, and then you know, having some other owners come into the, um, the playing field quite early on. Um, they, let me just say that it was sold for $30 million at that time. I went on to build the company um, with more sports and more entertainment product because the studios were really interested in that at that time. They, they wanted to have a lot more entertainment product. And so we broke out a lot of windows. We, windows in meaning the licensing windows, the timing of the licensing windows for cable television. There weren't any uh, in the contracts. People that were selling the programs only wanted to sell the television stations. They didn't have any opportunity to sell the cable networks. They didn't think it would be worth anything. And, um, and so it was really kind of an interesting opportunity for us to try to push open those windows and build the company. And one of the competitors that we had at that time was Ted Turner uh, with TBS. And it was really, Ted is a great competitor. Um, I, he was a, you know, a terrific uh, entrepreneur in our industry at an early time. And uh, I loved competing with him. And uh, for about five years, I thought we're never going to take this first place ratings race away from him in prime time. But we did by the middle 80s, and uh, he never got it back. And it was really, uh, it was really kind of fun uh, for me personally to be able to really sort of beat Ted at his own game. Um, but anyway, he's one of our great entrepreneurs. And um, a, Along about 1987, Time Inc. wanted to get out. They wanted to get out of this ownership. And the reason they wanted to get out is because they wanted to own CNN. They had a lot of value uh, that they thought they had for that Time magazine and so forth. And there was a big battle over that. And Time Inc. started vetoing everything we wanted to do uh, at USA Networks, uh, our program contracts, everything that we wanted to sign. They started. Uh, vetoing, and we were within, I'd say, about 60 days of going black because on the air because we wouldn't have any more programs left to run. It, was, it got to be a very tense situation. And the reason they wanted out is because in the partnership agreement between those three companies, they had to operate all their basic cable networks through USA, and Time Inc. wanted to own CNN by itself. So in order to own CNN, they'd have to exit. And it was... Um, it was a very, uh, you know, kind of tense time again, where you're kind of on the precipice of possibly going out of business, and this time because of uh, fights between your owners, and that can happen too. If when you bring in, whether it's investors or owners, that can happen too. And I, what I learned through this whole process is managing up, 
is like really, really important to understand how to manage up. Um, and I was managing people that were at each other's throats quite a bit of the time. I had 15 board members, five from each company. The CEO, the chairman of each of these companies, there were people like Barry Diller and Michael Eisner and Jerry Levin, and all these people were on the board at that time. And it was really a very heavy board for a young company. And, um, and so it was really an interesting experience. But I just say, I'm going to talk a little bit about constructing boards in a few minutes. And I think it's really important to understand what you need to, to uh, do to, in that case, I didn't choose the board members. But uh, it's important about how you manage them. In any event, they were bought out for $52 million for their third in 1987. It valued the company at $156 million on a private transaction. But I offered to buy it for $300 million at that time because it was worth a lot more than they were valuing it. And I thought it was such a great opportunity. Needless to say, uh, Paramount and Universal wouldn't, uh, they preferred to keep it for themselves. Uh, they were starting to feel like they actually had a valuable uh, entity, uh, I think. And uh, so they're, you know, I don't blame them, but it was a great disappointment to me that I, that I couldn't really take them out. In any event, we, we went on and built a lot of other things uh, over time. I launched Sci-Fi in 1992. That was a real great thing for the team, the team of people um, at USA, because it gave them a new product. And energizing people with some new challenge, a new product. I think sometimes when you do, when you build companies, you get your core team and you're so focused on your core asset that you know you really don't you have the opportunity to really introduce new things. You're going so quickly. By this time, we'd been operating for some time, and to bring that new infusion in was really quite important. So that was a lot of uh, fun for us, as as well to to launch that. And I did it sort of as an ode to, you know. Um, uh, Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke and Ray Bradbury, another science fiction writer that I really liked. But I knew that that was a core audience. And so bolting on another product that was really important for the, I think, for the industry uh, to have, that was launched in uh, 1992 for $100 million. And um, it's probably today worth about $4 billion. So, uh, and, and transactions. So these things, you know. You can have some pretty significant high growth. But what I learned along the way is that building a team is really so valuable. And to build a team with the strongest, now, I know people say this to you all the time, but it doesn't often strike people. Oftentimes when you're doing something new as an entrepreneur, you'll go out and sort of get your friends or people that you you know went to class with or so forth, and I think that the it, we all do that. Uh, we do people that we know well, but I think really you got to think about what are the skills I don't have, what don't I possess, what don't I do well, and bring in people that uh, can really add to that. And when we launched Sci-Fi, it was such an energizing team effort that people within the organization had a chance to really rise and show their real talents again, um, and that that was very encouraging and a lot of fun for people. Um, I'll flash forward to the end of it because I think that there were a lot of things that happened along the way that were a lot of fun, a lot of stories. But I will say that at the end, in 19, by 1996, we had USA Sci-Fi, USA International, which I launched in several, many countries around the world. But the partners, the owners, Universal and Paramount, had been bought and sold. Paramount was a, in a fight between Barry Diller and Sumner Redstone. Sumner Redstone won, and Viacom won that battle. Universal, which was MCA, uh, also called MCA at the time, uh, was sold to Masashita um, in the early 90s. That was not a very good sale. They didn't really know what the entertainment business was about. They didn't understand it. Um, it was you know, kind of a difficult period of time over there. And then it was sold again to Seagram's and Edgar Bronfman, Jr., um, was heading that company. So here we had Sumner Redstone on one hand and Edgar Bronfman Jr. on the other, uh, still both of them in the entertainment business today. And they were at loggerheads because they were arguing over this issue about everything being run under USA Network's banner. And of course, if I were sitting there and I were Sumner Redstone, I wouldn't have put MTV there either. And he didn't want to. He owned 100% of it. And Edgar was arguing that, that he had to do it. 
in the ownership because th and this was the battle that ensued for another two years. And operating a company under those conditions when either your investors or your owners are battling with each other in a vicious court battle um, that was juicy to read in the trade press, you know, but, but really uh, it, 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 you have to – the core of the team that you have working for you really comes out in bad times. It's really interesting to see how people react to pressure and people saying, oh, your company's going to be busted up and all this sort of stuff. And to keep them focused on it is really a, a what, lead, what you have to exert your leadership skills to do. And so I found out that, uh, I, you know, I had a really strong team during that period of time. But at the end of the day, Edgar Brockman won this court case. Sumner Redstone had to sell out his position to him. And the day after he sold out his position, Edgar turned around and sold to Barry Diller for $4.5 million, million. And that's uh, 19, that was in late 1997, actually. And, and I left in 1998, not too long after that, because it was Barry's company at that point. He renamed his company USA Networks. It, became, it was a public company because Home Shopping Network was a public company. He was the chairman, and that was my title, chairman. So we can't have two people having the same job. So he had more assets, and it was his company at that time, and I left. So um, I left to do some other things. Uh, I, I really thought that it would be fun to look back at the entrepreneurial uh, universe again. And to really see what was happening at this time, um, President Clinton called me and asked me if I would take over the chair of the National Women's Business Council. I wasn't really interested in doing it particularly. I knew of it. It really was a, it's a presidential appointment, but it's a commission. And it was a small <coughs> funded commission. It really was basically to see how women's businesses were progressing, uh, especially in government procurement contracts and things like that. And I said, no. I really thank you very much, but I wasn't interested. But he came back, and he sees like, I, he really wanted me to do this. And, and I thought about it. And I thought about access to capital and how access to private capital was really, really what I was interested in. And I wanted to see what entrepreneurs are doing in the private capital markets. And especially I looked at what women were doing. And when I looked at the venture market, I was shocked but not surprised. I guess, to find out that only 1.7% of the venture money backed women entrepreneurs in 1997. And I thought we could do something about that because entrepreneurism is so exciting. It's so much fun, to, but you have to be able to access the capital to participate in it. And a lot of women and a lot of men start businesses that aren't venture backable. Small percentage of businesses are actually venture businesses. More so in this environment because this is the mecca uh, of all venture capital. But but still, it's a very small percentage, and I said I would do it if I were allowed to go into the venture market or the private equity market. And um, so I uh, decided to go along that way. And if I had a million dollars well, I'd buy you a house, I would buy you a house. And if I had a million dollars, if I had a million dollars, well, I'd buy you some art, a Picasso or a Garfunkel. If I had a million dollars, I'd buy you a some instruction on how to get off of this. I did that and it didn't go off. Try it again.
Thank you, Peter. I appreciate your help. <laughs> um, in any event, um, uh, I decided to uh, come to Silicon Valley uh, for an idea of launching uh, venture forums uh, for women entrepreneurs. And, and we really, this, this is 1999, by the way, and money was pouring over the transom. How many were here in this area in 1999? Okay. Money, I mean, you couldn't get out of the way of the money, right? There was no way. <laughs> Somehow women avoided it, though, uh, because they weren't getting any of it. <laughs> and so we said, I said, we've got to change this picture. And what are we going to do to change the picture? And everything we've learned applies to men as well as women, except a few things. Um, and that is that women needed to have someone open the door for them. Um, I went to talk to, I, I heard uh, a legend uh, in angel investing, you know, talk about this. Hans Severin, who, God rest his soul, isn't with us anymore, but headed the band of angels. And, um, and he's, he, he was talking in New York about how angels do their investing and how the band of angels came together and there were a bunch of guys from, um, you know, the silicon, you know, the chip industry, um, the semiconductor industry um, that had gotten together, friends, and they started to invest together. And they then he went through his whole, you know, layout of how they came together, what kind of companies they looked at, how many companies they looked at, how many of those were selected and how they got funded and what the expectations of the, of the angel investors were. And it was a really good layout, and I, and I learned a lot listening to him you know, over a breakfast meeting. But at the end of it, I said to him, gee, Hans, you know, how, do you ever see women come in and pitch their businesses? And he said, no, not really. I don't see too many. And I said, well, how many businesses did you fund? And he said, well, 74. And I said, well, how many of those are run by women? He said, we don't care about that. We, uh, if, you know, we just like green. And uh, I said, <laughs> yeah, but how many were, how many of those companies are run by women? And he said, well, none. Then I went and talked to about 50 venture capitalists around the country, men and women, mostly men, 70, 97% of the venture capitalists in those days were men. And they all said the same thing. Pretty much they didn't see women. So we had a situation where they really weren't being rejected as entrepreneurs, they just weren't on the stage. So we decided we had to get people up on the stage. And so some people here have presented their companies before forums, right? Some people here, have you presented a company before a venture forum? All right, a few have. Well, we came here and we said, we gotta find out if we, you know, if we have enough good companies. And we've gotta find them and we've gotta get some support of the people in the community. Otherwise, if people, venture capitalists aren't going to come, then, then there won't be any funding anyway. So we've got to find out. So we went out and tried to get a cabinet together. And it wasn't a kitchen cabinet. It was a capital cabinet. And we put, them together, we had put some people together. And um, I'll show you who they were at the time. Some of these people you will recognize, I'm sure. Maybe one of them spoke here today. Um, so this is a group of people that had a helped us out. Uh, Denise Rousseau was the head of the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs, was our partner. Amy Moman uh, was, was heading the National Women's Business Council at the time. Larry Ellison, you might say, what is Larry doing there? Um, <laughs> uh, Larry was very generous, actually. He, I asked him for the conference center uh, at Oracle. I thought it was very important that people be seen in an important presentation stage with the right graphics, the right support, <laughs> that people came and they said we're, some, we're at something important. Don Lucas was on the Oracle board at that time, but he, he's, a, he's an angel investor. And um, you know he came up and supported us with the invitation list. Kate Muther was from Cisco, and she was doing philanthropic work at that time. Heidi Rosen spoke here this morning um, and is a venture capitalist and entrepreneur herself. And Jim Robbins was fantastic. Uh, he has an incubator, and he was really great about what kind of skills do you have to have to be able to present your companies right, and he really helped us to learn um, with the companies. Anyway, to bring that story to a focal point, we did, when we put out our applications, one week before the applications were due, we only had 40 companies apply, and we were like really nervous. We thought, if we don't have 100 companies apply, I mean, how can we get at least 10 or 15 that are qualified? And we, we started to sweat it. We thought, 
maybe people told us that we wouldn't find enough companies were right. But it turned out on the day that the applications were due, we had 350 applications. And Stanford Business School was very helpful to us because Stanford and Berkeley Business School did the first cut and took those applications down to 120. And then those 120 were requalified, and 60 were uh, left, and then all 60 got personal interviews, and we selected 26. To make a long story short, the shorter, at least, that of those 26 companies that presented on January 27, 2000, 22 got funded. Two companies merged, one woman sold her business, and one company wasn't funded. Now, money was still pouring over the transom in January 2000. So, I mean, it was a great track record and a great story. But uh, 60 days later, tech market started to tank and went downhill for about the next three years. And I think people here in the Valley know that very, you know, very well. Um, but we continued to uh, present companies. And um, some of the companies that we presented, Pam came here from Stanford. Um, her company, Xenogen, went public in 2004. It's a biotech company. Uh, she had been this for 10 years now. She raised $120 million before she went uh, public. Uh, it's a great story, uh, a biotech story. It's a photo. <clears throat> uh, diagnostic company that has really done very well. Actually, let me go back to that for a second. Pam um, had a couple th has a couple things to say about what she learned along the way in being an entrepreneur. One when you have a new company, really get people who can roll up their sleeves and do the work. You really don't need a whole bunch of managers running around managing other people. You have to have people that are really going to do the work. She said, make sure that you get your revenue streams right and get to profitability really quickly and select your board very carefully because it's one of your best assets. So that's some of the advice that she has. This is kind of interesting. Zipcar, this is one of our companies out of Boston. Uh, this company is a, a, an auto club, if you will. Um, Robin and her partner saw this kind of company in Switzerland when they were there. It's, uh, you, you belong to it as a member. It's kind of a difference between, the, it's midway between owning a car and renting a car. You belong to the auto club. The club has cars parked all over the city at different locations. You go online, you sign up, you take your smart card as your membership card. And when you want to use the car, you sign up, say, I'm going to pick it up at 2 o'clock on Friday afternoon, and I need it for four hours, and whatever it is, and you put it in. Go in, pick up your car at the location you said you were going to pick it up. The smart card opens the car, starts your account, runs, you pay by the hour, you leave the car back in the same place, you take your card out, closes out your account, and you get your billing. It's a very simple process. And this is uh, this was launched back in 2000, and um, they're doing very well. They're built out now. They've got... You know, they're in New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Washington, D.C., Chicago. And there's another company, Flexcar, here on the West, that started here on the West Coast, and perhaps you know of it. Anyway, these companies are doing quite well. Uh, Kathleen Chen, you probably heard about 51 Job, because 51 Job did very well for David Chow and Dow Management, um, venture capitalists. Uh, what she presented in 2000, and that's like monster.com of China, and for those of you that don't know it, but what David liked about it was that it had brick and mortar as well as online. And they've pursued that um, uh, today. And they've built out, I think, 21 offices throughout Chinese cities today and have online. And they went public in 2004. I think the nice story here are two things for us. Don Lucas, who you saw before on the other screen, actually wound up being the chair uh, of this company. So Don did well on his investment. And David w did well with their 14 point $3 million investment, their um, payout was $235 million uh, on this IPO. So it's in the, it's in the proof is in the pudding, if you would say, uh, you know, as people say. And I think that these companies are showing that they can uh, deliver for their investors. And uh, iRobot's one of my favorites. Helen Grenier is, uh, is really um, an, a woman who has a connection, an emotional connection to me, because in 1997, excuse me, 1977, uh, when I launched uh, the USA Network, she was also being influenced by a man that changed her life. Um, he was a little bit odd looking. He was bald, that's good. He was, had, his legs were too short. 
and his arms were too long, and he had a very funny voice. And uh, he was R2-D2 from Star Wars. And she was 11 years old, and she saw it in the movie theater, and she fell in love with robotics and robots. And uh, she and her two partners uh, at MIT launched their company, iRobot, as a, a defense contractor. And her main business is robotics that detect explosives. So she, her robots are running around Afghanistan and Baghdad and trying to find explosives before they blow up. Um, but in, when she came to Springboard in 2002, she was going to launch her commercial company. Uh, and, um, and that was the Roomba. It's a robotic vacuum cleaner. And she did very well with the Roomba. And now she also has the Scuba. And the Scuba washes floors instead of vacuuming your rugs. So she has a lot of products that she's bringing out into the marketplace. Um, they went public in October of 2005. And her stock is today trading about close to 50% over their issue price. She's doing quite well with it. She was very big at the Consumer Product Show. Just a, as a, 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 just a kind of a summary of what we've done at Springboard, we've had 16 venture forms and prevented, uh, presented excuse me, 350 companies. Out of those 350 companies, 42% of them have been financed through that process. 80% ultimately get financed. So uh, I think it's a good qualifying process. And I think the kinds of tracks that you have here today for the different you know, points of learning entrepreneurism and participating in them are some of the things that we teach at Springboard. Um, over $3.3 billion has been raised by these companies. Uh, so they've got a good track record. 20% have had positive liquidity events so far. 80% are in business. Five IPOs, and there are a couple more registrations coming up. I think the message here is if you can identify high growth companies and give people the training like you're learning here in the entrepreneurial track to really mount their companies properly, it's really important and can really help the success of the companies dramatically. Um, and so it's a lesson that we're really quite proud of, of you know, having to teach people. But we're really working with our companies. We don't leave them after they present. There we've got these women as alumni also, and we work to grow the companies, and that's a really important step as well. But there are some things that you're learning here today, and, and I think there's some things that are so obvious about being an entrepreneur and mounting these companies, but they're, they're, they're not actually understood. And what we find out that people say, know your market. So you know what a lot of people do? They give you statistics about the market. Okay, that's good. Know what, what is the size of the market? But do you really know your market? Who in that market specifically is, are your customers going to be? How deeply do you know and understand that marketplace so you can articulate it, not just give statistics about a marketplace? Anyone can go and pull statistics. What you really, really need to know is how those companies that are going to, or consumers, how they really act to the react and act to the product that you have. You really have to know it. And one thing that has kind of amazed me in this process is how little people really know about their revenue streams. That's so important to really understand and test your revenue models. That's really important to do. Uh, plain talk, what do I mean by that? Um, we have a lot of biotech companies and so forth present, as well as technology companies. You've got to be able to explain your product in, in sort of plain English to a layman who doesn't know, because the investors may not know everything about your product either. And you've got to really talk in their terms and talk to them about what they're going to make. How much money are they going to make on your product or your service and when? And anticipate the objection. What's wrong with your plan? What could people say, I like it, but? When you can answer the but before they get there, in your presentations, it really helps to diffuse. Let me give you an example. Heidi Royson that we spoke about before had a company called eHow. It came out about the same time that Ask Jeeves was very popular. That was before the Google story. And it had a similar type product. And when eHow would go to present, they would be, if people would say to them, yeah, but that's like Ask Jeeves, and Ask Jeeves already has that. So, I mean, what's different? 
And they understood finally that they had to say, when Ask Jeeves wants to know, they ask eHow. Because actually, Ask Jeeves used eHow technology. So it was an issue. That's what I'm talking about. How do you diffuse the objections? Um, corporate playbook. Um, I talked about bringing in new blood. This is a, as you get a little bit um, more advanced in your entrepreneurial, in your company is growing, um, and you know you're hiring. And, and I think newness is not a problem in the early stages. But if you're so fortunate as to be able to stay on with your company, eat, take it public or sell it, and still stay on to run it, you've got to continue to bring in new blood. I mean, General Electric. Well, look, most of us are pretty far away from General Electric, but you know they get rid of the top, bottom 10 percent of their performers every year. Sort of, as a matter of course, that's how they do it. They just weed out people. If you don't perform and you're on the bottom, you're out. Um, and I, I, think, I think that's one way of doing it, but just bringing in new blood or changing people's assignments as you see what their talents are, you can see who you can move around. It's really important to get new thinking, not to block thinking processes. Making decisions without consensus, what does that mean? I think most entrepreneurs are driven by their own passion and their own ideas, and that's probably not a block for them, but as you get bigger and grow into a company and maybe then a larger corporation, people have funny ways of blocking things from happening. And some of it is people just don't acknowledge. They don't want to come to any consensus. And leaders have to manage around that. If you're a leader and really believe in it, you have to go for it and manage around that not having a consensus, but because you really believe in it. I mentioned this before, I hire people, hire people that are more talented than you are, smarter than you are, and the things that you don't know. Really, really important for success. You know, when you're trying to get acknowledgement, it's about you, about your performance, about what you've accomplished. When you're a leader, it's about them. What are they going to accomplish? What is your team going to be able to do? And their success is your success. So you really want to hire. I've always wanted to hire people that were smarter than I am in all the different areas because I figure I can learn from them if I can orchestrate them well. I can be the leader. And that's how I've looked at it, and it's worked really well for me in building a multi-billion dollar business. Orchestrate the team. That's what your job is as your company grows to make sure that you are the leader of the orchestra, that you get the best talent and you get the right people in the right slots. It's so tempting sometimes to hire friends and people that you've worked with before. They may not be the right people, but they're ones you know right then. That's not necessarily the right thing to do. Manage up, I talked about that. I talked a little bit about managing up and how challenging that is. It might be your investors instead of your board, corporate board. But managing your investors well is really a challenge for the entrepreneur. Getting the right investors that are going to help you add value to your company is really important. And of course, rule number six. And what is rule number six? I got this from uh, Benjamin Zander, who is the conductor of the Philharmonic in Boston. His rule number six, don't take yourself so damn seriously all the time. Got to have some fun. Constructing the board, just a real quick couple things on that because I know we're coming to a conclusion. It's very important. A lot of in entrepreneurial, and especially in venture entrepreneurial activities, a lot of times your board winds up just being your investors and yourself and maybe somebody, one other person from your company. I think it's really, really, really important to think about a board of advisors when you're very early on, of people that can actually make calls, open doors, not just big names, but people that actually do something for you. It's, that's really important to do uh, because you need the outreach. It's all networking. It's who makes the call for you. That's what a lot of it is all about. And to get those people on with you early on and to have them there so that when you do construct a board for a sale or an IPO, you have to have, diff well, now today you have to have independent people on your board because of the requirements of public for IPOs, but uh, on Sarbanes-Oxley requirements um, that uh, require all the independence on your different committees. But it's really important to think about it early on 
and to think about people that can add value to you. And no one really emphasizes that because uh, most of, you know, I think because mostly you hear, you know, venture capitalists have a lot to say about how the company gets operated. But as an entrepreneur, you want your friends in court too, and you want people that you can go to. Not necessarily that they're always going to agree with you, but that they can add value, add balance, and bring new skills, operational skills in particular, to your board. So I think those are sort of things. And I think just in parting, James Dice and later on this afternoon, he's got this wonderful, he's got to be wonderful. He's a great showman. But I thought we'd have a little dueling vacuum cleaners. I wish I could stay. Uh, anyway. <laughs> The Roombas, running circles. I think they're quite different products, actually. But anyway, uh, I hope you have fun with him. I think it'll, he'll be a great speaker. Um, it's been a great pleasure to share some time with you today.